Well, on my subreddit, somebody asked the question, what are the scariest creepy pastas you've ever read? Now tonight, I'm going to present you the first two that came up. So time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. When camping about three weekends ago in the Huntsville National Forest in Texas, me and three friends that came home for the weekend, they're all in college and usually we all get together at least once a year, all friends from high school. For the camping trip, we plan to go backpacking deep in the forest, live off of fish that we catch and animals that we can track. Now, we've been doing this for a while in Texas and in numerous places, Arizona, Colorado, if anyone's familiar with the Spanish peaks there, or New Mexico, so, well, we're pretty much used to anything you'd encounter out there. It was my turn to pick where we went camping, so I chose Huntsville. Well, more accurately, it's Huntsville, New Waverly. And so we drive up there and park our car in a camping park spot and start walking off into the forest. We had some laughs along the way, everyone catching up with each other's lives. We walked until it started to get dark and set up camp where we stopped. Everyone gathered wood to make a fire and we set our tent up. And we do what we always do, try and scare each other with weird stories. Now, around this time we started to smell something very faint. It was noticeable but not overbearing. We couldn't put our finger on what it was so we just carried on. Mike had to go piss and he walked off into the forest. A second later he came running back, piss all down his jeans like he'd missed really bad. Immediately we all crack up and throw some jokes at him. Then we noticed that he was white as snow and trying to catch his breath. He starts screaming for us to follow him and runs off. Well, we all get serious and go follow him, not knowing what the problem was. We start to hear a faint scream and crying in the distance, in the direction we were running. It was pitch black away from the camp, and Mike had the only flashlight. We left ours at the camp. He had his from his trip taking a piss, and so at this stage we didn't have much choice but to follow the light, which was frantically pointing here and there in front of him. The scream gets closer, and Mike starts to slow down. We then noticed a ratty old cabin that looked like it was abandoned, except for a faint light that we could see from one of the old mildew-covered windows. And the crying was intense. Whoever it was couldn't breathe enough to let out a full yell. We all followed Mike up to the front door. We could all hear the crying from inside. As soon as he knocked on the door, it stopped. Now we all waited and heard really heavy footsteps walking fast at the door. There was a giant slam against the door and the sound of a bolt unlocking. And then, nothing. We waited for a bit. Knocked a few more times, but still nothing happened. Oh, we walked around the house. There was no fucking way any of us were leaving each other's side. And we noticed a window, which was a good way up. Alex took a deep breath and asked us to give him a boost so he could see inside. Well, me and Mike lifted him up to the window. We watched him brush away dirt and webs from the window and place his face close to it to try and see something. There was a quick beat, and suddenly he breathed in fast and let out a loud scream. Then he fell back from the window, screaming bloody murder all the way. We tried to calm him down, but he was hysterical. We went to him, but he started to shake, to punch and kick and cuss, you name it. And he then took off towards the camp. None of us wanted to be separated, so we all ran close behind him. We caught up to him and grabbed him and set him down. The fire was dying out, so I grabbed some nearby wood that we collected and added it to the fire. My hands were shaking. But I had to do something. I went back to Alex and we all tried to calm him down. He wouldn't. He just kept screaming and breathing so hard that he eventually fainted. All of us are terrified now and we all kept the fire high until sunrise. 
Periodically, Alex kept waking up, screaming just like before. By sunrise, he was up and looked catatonic, just mumbling to himself and whimpering. So, Mia might decide to go look at the cabin now it was daylight. We searched where we thought it was, except there was nothing there. Nothing at all. The indistinct smell from last night had now grown into a very strong smell of something dead, something stale. We headed back to the camping site. And when we got there, we found Alex had chewed into the sides of his face and swallowed so much blood that he was throwing up. John was at his back, and he looked like he was about to die from exhaustion. I guess we all looked that way. I just didn't notice until I saw his face. Alex said quietly that we needed to leave. Now. We all started to pack up the tent. It started to rain really heavily. It was about noon, and the sky started to grow really dark. Alex started to go into a panic. He went and grabbed a large stick and yelled at us to leave it. Leave now, or he'd knock us out and drag us out of here himself. Mike started to yell at him and they started to fight. We broke it up and finished packing, and then started to make our way back. After a little while, we arrived at a creek we crossed the previous day, only it was flooded over, and the water was moving too fast for us to cross it. Alex started to scream again, yelling at Mike for taking his time packing up the tent when we could have gotten out of there earlier. This went on for a while until we finally convinced Alex to calm down and tell us what had happened. He said as soon as he put his face to the glass, a face on the other side did the same thing and started to smile really big. It had dark eyes and a dark mouth which was much bigger than Alex's and the smile got as large as it could. A giant shadow behind it swung something down and sliced its face off. The face was stuck to the window, and he said it started to laugh quietly as it slid down. Mike, still pissed off and though he wouldn't admit it beginning to get freaked out, started to argue with him again. We eventually started to follow the creek for a way to cross. We then started to see toys floating in the creek. Really old toys. Old Barbie dolls and not the baby dolls. This wasn't like any old trash floating in the creek, though. This was a lot of Barbies and a lot of baby dolls. One washed towards the side and Mike picked it up. It had some kind of a voice chip that was dying and started to say some gurgling words we couldn't understand, followed by its sad excuse for laughter. Then it sounded like it was whispering. We thought the batteries must be dying. We threw it down. We kept going, and the sun was starting to set. Alex was freaking out more now, and was whimpering and breathing heavily. We all started to see shadows move behind trees. Something we all called BS on until we were all seeing it. It was barely light out, and we stopped as we could see the cabin right in front of us. None of us knew what to think. Mike says... This is bullshit. I'm going in there. Alex tries to stop him. We all do. All of us just wanted to go home. Mike says to all of us to fuck off. Do our own thing. He doesn't care anymore. This is all bull. We start to hear hundreds of the same sort of baby doll as before. Laughing, whispering, trying to sing. We start to move forward past the cabin. All of us we kept pushing forward. We smelled something dead in the air, something stale, the same something as before. We started to hear something crying, something screaming, but we kept on going. We eventually crossed the creek and left the woods, got back to our vehicle and got in. It's pitch black and we drive. We're about to get on the 45 to Houston, but the road is under construction and can't be accessed points to a detour. As we head towards the detour, it seems to be a small, bumpy dirt road going into the woods. 
we then see a young girl come up to us. She looks like she was in trouble, young and pretty. She approaches the passenger side door and she looks like she's really drugged up, or beaten up. Alex doesn't roll down the windows, nor does he open the door. She reaches for the handle and he immediately locks it. She puts her face on the window and starts to smile really big. We floor it. Alex starts to cry and scream and we're all breathing heavy. We finally cut onto a street that takes us onto the 45 and we take it the whole way. When we get back to my apartment, everybody doesn't know what to say and we all break apart and go our separate ways. Mike messages me later and says he's going to go back. Well, I try to convince him not to, and all he does is say it was our own minds that were screwing with us. I think he just went to prove to himself he wasn't scared. But I can smell that stench everywhere now. I don't go out anymore. I just stay in and don't answer the door. Last week everyone I met was acting really strange. People that I knew for a long time, and total strangers. My own dad, when I went to his place to eat supper with him, he just watched me. Strangely, when I was sitting down, he didn't say a word the whole time. I kept asking him, what's wrong? He just slowly shook his head. When I was leaving to go up, I turned to wave. He had black eyes and an open mouth, like he was in pain. When I started to walk back, he shut the door and bolted it. I stared there, knocking and knocking, nothing. I called to him. I called his phone, but it was disconnected. He even called the police. Halfway through the questions they were asking me, the connection started to fade into static. I could hear a faint mumbling, singing and laughing. Mike has completely vanished. There's not even a record of him being alive. And when I call Alex's house, they talk to me like I'm some salesman. They say they don't know any Alex and to please stop calling. The person who tells me that is Alex's mother. I can't get a hold of John. Someone knocked on my door and when I went to look, I saw a face completely covering the peephole and a giant smile started to form. And called the cops again, and instead of it turning into static, they got really strange. Sir, are you affected by any drugs at the moment? No. Are you coming home any time soon? Excuse me. Come home. And the phone call ended. My mail slot swings every now and then. Someone is sliding pieces of baby dolls through it. I try to call people now, and all I can hear is static and bad baby doll noises and this crying and screaming. My TV is busted, but when I go to piss, I can hear it turn on. God, I might be going insane. Whoever lives above me started to scream in pain and cry deeply recently. I hear giant footsteps from their apartment. I hear bangs and something falling to the ground. From the neighbours to the right of my apartment, I hear what sounds like a baby that never gets tended to, and then it sounds like a baby doll whose batteries are dying. My phone's been ringing now, and it's Alex telling me things in a language that I've never heard before, nor could even manage to repeat. I keep getting emails of pictures of black and small colorations that I can't even now even access my email. Someone knocks on the door, and they slam against it. I hear the bolts unlocking one by one, and I run to make sure to lock all of them back. And then, I sit down and begin to cry. It began like most other nights at the Lorette nursing home. The sound of my footsteps filled the stark, empty hallway as I did my rounds. I'd heard the orderlies refer to this area as the vegetable patch, and their characterization wasn't too far off. Now, what may not be public knowledge is that coma patients oftentimes get sent to long-term care facilities such as this, 
regardless of age, if they don't have any life-threatening medical conditions, or hope of waking for that matter. I glided past the rooms with my goal in sight. As I neared his suite, my feet picked up their pace. I entered Bill Waters' room and found his wife yet again at his side. I admired this woman greatly for her devotion to Bill. After nine long years, she was still his doting wife. Seeing her almost daily really touched my heart. This man must have been something special. Recently I'd built a rapport with this woman and looked forward to seeing her kind face more than I care to admit. This made what I'd planned for Bill much more difficult to keep a secret. You know visiting hours are over, Mrs. Waters, I said with a warm smile. She paused before responding. He's in there, you know. Oh, I'm sure he is, I replied. No, I mean it. I can just sense his presence. When you've been with someone as long as we've been together, you just know. Well, I wouldn't come down here if... A tear streamed down her face. I was mesmerized by how she hadn't let go, that he was still very much a part of her. I found myself gravitating towards him more so than the other sleepers. In fact, I developed a kind of obsession with him. His wife's affection for her comatose husband was contagious. I'd already decided that I was going to try something unorthodox with Bill. As a matter of fact, it was to begin the following day from my conversation with Martha that evening. My anxiety filled me with restless dreams that night and remained with me the following day. You see, I had big plans for Bill. I'd been under the same suspicion as his wife for quite some time. Even though he'd been declared a vegetable by my colleagues, there was just something about his magnanimous face that screamed otherwise. On a lark, I'd already hooked him up to an fMRI and seen some startling results. His brain activity was alive and manic. Though I was incredulous at first, it also seemed to indicate that he was capable of responding to my voice and answering simple questions on a strictly neurological level. Well, I played this close to the chest and hadn't revealed this to anyone for two reasons. First, I guess you'd call this the noble one, I wanted to be a hundred percent certain that he was in fact still cognizant before filling his long-suffering wife with any false hope. Second, I guess the narcissistic reason, as a neuroscientist at heart, I stumbled across something potentially earth-shattering. I wanted to really impress the medical community and the public at large with what I was planning. Our facility had an fMRI machine which I had nearly unfettered access to at night. So with Bill placed in the tube, I told him to think about a warm summer breeze. I checked the scans and told him to think about it again. Well, the results were astonishingly similar. I spoke clearly and articulately that this means yes, that if he wants to answer yes to a question, he has to think of that breeze. Do you understand? A flurry of brain activity followed, not indicating the results I was looking for. Listen, Bill, I really need you to focus. Think of a warm summer breeze. This means yes. Do you understand? The thought pattern appeared once more and a smile cracked across my face. Now I want you to think about a bucket of ice water. I want you to imagine plunging your hand inside. I want you to really feel the cold bill. Now the screen shows something wholly dissimilar to the previous command. Think about it again. Same results. This is no. I had him practice yes and no for a while. He got on with astonishing speed. When I was satisfied with his ability to respond, I finally asked, Is your name Bill Waters? The results indicated yes. An even larger smile beamed from my face. Do you have a wife? Yes. Do you have children? No. I was very concerned that I was going to receive another yes result. When I saw the neurological pattern emerge, my elation and admiration for this man grew tenfold. 
And then I asked a question I'd been dreading. Are you in pain? Yes. My heart sank. The activity that I was seeing indicated this. I couldn't even begin to comprehend the existential anguish he was experiencing, let alone the excruciating physical pain. A little piece of me died right there in that room. This only strengthened my determination to help this man in any way I could. Do you know where you are? Yes. You're in a care facility in Roshosha, Wisconsin. Is that correct? No. I tried again, simplifying the question. Are you in a care facility? No. Confusion set in. I surmised that I was admiring this progress so much that I'd failed to realize the strain I was putting on him. Well, I backed off for that day and kept my findings to myself. He was in no danger of going anywhere, and there were plenty more tests to run before I could make this stunning revelation public. In my bed that evening, I came up with an ambitious course of action. This was going to take a lot of time and effort, but I was confident I'd get results. The next day I revealed my plan to Bill. With my knowledge of neurological signatures, I came up with 26 distinct thought patterns that would be easy to distinguish in fMRI results. The letter A is jumping into a pile of sand, B is rubbing your fingers on a Brillo pad, and so on. Each one would represent a letter of the alphabet. Now, this is going to be a long and painstaking process that's going to require a lot of patience. Do you want to continue? Yes. Yeah. So with time and care, we began to work on learning the alphabet. Progress was more rapid than I could ever have imagined. Bill was an excellent student. Oh, I'll never, ever forget when he'd nailed down the letter I. I believe it was thinking about your bare foot entering a leather shoe. Oh, his brain lit up like a live wire. This is what he was telling me over and over again. Hi, 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 hi. My heart exploded with jubilation. I never could have imagined that someone simply communicating hi to me would fill me with such raw emotion. Strangely, at that moment I felt closer to Bell than I'd ever felt to another human being. Tears welled up in my eyes. <laughs> well, hi, Bill. The next day I placed him in the tube again. This is the first thing he said to me. Hi, 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 hell, 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 hell. His excitement was palpable. I was touched yet again. However, we were so close to completing the alphabet, I firmly stated that we needed to focus. I told him to concentrate on the task at hand. We continued our work that week and made significant progress. I went to bed that Monday with a smile on my face and an unparalleled feeling of contentment and accomplishment. And this would all come crashing down the following day. So, Bill, let's talk. Hi, hi. Oh, God, hell. Hi, hi. Hi, Bill. Now, concentrate for a second. What's your name? I waited patiently as Bill's brain went to work. Bill. Oh, God. Help. Great job, Bill. Now, what's your wife's name? Martha. I, 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 help. Excellent. Now, where are you? In hell. My heart skipped a beat. I double-checked the results. That's what it translated to. No, no, you're in a long-term care facility. Look, you're in a coma. Do you understand? No. Help. The image I picked for L was driving on a Sunday afternoon through the country. To think that such a placid image could be imparting such an unsettling message sent shivers up and down my spine. I left the room briefly to calm my nerves and also to give Bill a break. 
As I returned, I could see Bill was still talking. Say me. So hot. I, 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 help. Bill, calm down, I stammered. You're in a hospital. You're fine. I'm here. It'll be okay. No. Hell for ver In hell. And for the first time in a while, I was feeling helpless. Bill's brain activity was crushing my heart. With all of the hard work and time we'd spent together, I was beyond attached to him. My emotions ran high. It was unprofessional and spur of the moment, but I blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. Oh, Bill, just wake up! The emotion in that cry startled me. I'd simply become too invested at this point. While these thoughts were rushing through my head, Bill's brain began to react again. I looked at the results. No, won't be me. What? I asked, almost at my wit's end. We'll be Osh Demon, named Osh. Fear seized me. At this point I began to question my abilities to interpret these readings. However, after double-checking everything, the message was loud and clear, so to speak. It'll be all right, Bill. I'm here. It'll be all right. I assured him repeatedly. No. Hell. Eternal. Disturbed to my core, I went home that night and attempted to sleep, but slumber refused to find me. Well, after hanging out the phone, I hightailed it to the nursing home. I didn't care about the hour. I had to see with my own eyes right then and there. Bill was awake and talking. Fucking medical miracle. I entered the room and saw Martha cradling her husband. Oh, the unparalleled joy I was expecting in my heart was tempered by Bill's icy glare. As I introduced myself, his eyes trained on me. They exuded none of the warmth I'd envisioned they would. They were cold and calculating. He frowned at me and didn't accept my hand. Oh, fair enough, he was still recovering, and I didn't take his current state as a personal slight at the time. I looked at Martha as she continued to grasp onto her husband. The smile on her face refused to leave, even as Bill was clearly recoiling from her touch. Well, the next day I revealed what I'd done. I made my results, save for the last session, public. I was lauded as a hero and received the accolades I was expecting. However, it all felt empty. Bill wanted no part of this and remained aloof and indifferent towards me. First, I was worried that he thought I'd exploited him, but this didn't seem to be the case. As soon as I heard about his miraculous recovery, I couldn't wait to start a friendship with him. However, the guy just wanted nothing to do with me. With a now indelible frown hanging on his face, he rebuffed any opportunities for future research. He even refused to meet up for coffee, which hurt immensely. Now, this all culminated with a conversation I had with Bill's wife three weeks ago. She entered my office looking weak and haggard. She'd aged what would seem like a decade in the intervening weeks since I'd last seen her. Before I could posit a greeting, she said, it isn't him. Pardon, Martha? He isn't my husband. My husband was a kind and gentle man, always with the warmest smile on his face, but this guy, this thing... She trailed off as she began to weep. I embraced her while having to choke back my own tears in the process. Listen, Martha, he's been through a lot. Many patients that recover from a comatose state experience personality shifts and abnormalities in behavior. Just have patience. He'll be the Bill you've always loved. Just give it time. I said this with conviction, but didn't believe a word of it. Something really was amiss. There was no denying it. Just give it time, Martha, I said once more. Unfortunately, time was something Martha didn't have. As I enter the visiting area of the jail, I pick up the phone. Staring back at me from the other side of the glass is a face that had once filled me with such hope. 
Now I can barely look upon this homicidal monster without feeling physically ill. Jesus, what he did to Martha, the way they found her. The scowl hangs below his glaring and wanton eyes. They're trained on me with a ferocious intensity. He picks up the phone. Silence. Och, I say with trepidation. My rational mind barely allows that word to escape my lips. A hint of light gleams in his eyes. His frown turns upwards in a nauseating smirk. This transforms his face into a visage of pure, unadulterated evil. I have to fight and not avert my gaze. And with a wink, he finally speaks to me. Greetings, Dr. Williams. Bill says, Hi. So, a uh, brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, what are the scariest creepy pastas you've ever read? Um, share your thoughts in the comment section below the video, or go over to the subreddit and leave your thoughts there. Uh, wherever it is, doesn't matter. Over the next few weeks, I will be doing what you suggest. The scariest stories you've ever read, brought to life by the voice of Dr. <laughs> Creeper. <laughs> well, I'll do my best to uh, inject a bit of uh, scariness into them. You know what I mean, don't you? Of course you do. Well, that's it for me for one night, but I'll be back again very, very soon. You'll stay safe out there, okay? Nobody get that virus. Promise? Okay. See you all again real soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.